and welcome to Nicole Reacts, a show in which I, Nicole, react to online marketing gurus that I find on the internet. My qualifications for snark and commentary are that I've owned a legitimate marketing company for 15 years, in that time having worked with hundreds of clients on marketing strategy and implementation. So I know a fair bit when it comes to things like social media marketing, email marketing, blogging, website development, content marketing, search engine optimization, those kind of topics. So stick around if you like lightly learning about that while also debunking some myths that I see a lot of online gurus talking about. If you like this content, I hope you consider subscribing, but you know, keep watching if you're not sure. And if you want to see more of this style of content where I react to MLM trainers, marketing gurus, authors, public speakers, anybody who's talked about marketing pretty much, you can check out the Nicole Reacts playlist on the YouTube channel as well as the Nicole Reacts category on the blog, and those are places where past episodes live. So today's person is Grant Cardone. I started reacting to a Grant Cardone video, and I got two hours into filming, had to go to a meeting, so future Nicole is back for part two, and this interview with Grant Cardone happened five months ago, so guessing like January, February of 2023. I'm recording this at the beginning of July. It's a podcast interview of someone else's podcast that Grant uploaded to his channel, so we're coming in off of a commercial. So there's going to be a black screen and then the content's going to start again. So he's talking about marketing and branding with this greater property group that has a podcast. It's pretty bro -y, So uh, just be prepared. And let's see what Grant Cardone has to say in the remaining 25-ish minutes that we have of this video. I do, I do want to move into, uh, so yeah, very interesting. By the way, this guy will ask a question. And then Grant Cardone kind of rambles on for a while and the guy kind of fidgets and then asks another question. So it looks like now we're heading into him asking another question. Uh, to ask a question, uh, before we ask about Cardone Capital specifically, you know, you interview and you deal with and you partner with some of the most successful, you know, entrepreneurs, business builders, you know, entertainers in the world. Is there a commonality you see among successful people? Like, is there one, you know, singular, you know, trait that you see among very successful people? I'm wondering if the entertainers and all that, I'm wondering how much of that is connected to Scientology and people who are in Scientology with Grant Cardone. I'm wondering if that's why he has access to these famous people. But I'll be curious what he says the, the common thread of success is. I bet he says there is one, though. Well, yes. What, what, the one thing that's really, like, I, I'll just tell you behind the scenes. Like, I've interviewed Usher, Mayweather. I put on these big stages, right? I don't know, Donald Trump. Kevin Hart, uh, Dana White, John Travolta. Okay, so not all these people are Scientologists, but some of them are. Kevin Turner that worked with Sam Walton and Bill Gates. These people get nervous too, man. So when you interview people, they get nervous. Okay, I mean, I think it's natural, especially when you know you're being recorded to like want to come off well. And if you're being interviewed, you're not really in control over the edit. So yeah, I understand why someone would be nervous. I've seen some of these people shake, like shake sweat. I had a guy, he's worth $12 billion, Tillman Fertitta, man. He, he got on that stage. I had to make him comfortable. I mean, this is a guy with a 300 foot yacht, multiple planes, helicopters, uh, 600 restaurants, a trillion dollars worth of revenue over his career. I wonder who this person is. I've never heard of them, but I mean, I'm not well versed on all the billionaires, of course. Still gets nervous. I've seen Broadway stars, man. I mean, so he asked if there was a common thread. And is the common thread that they all get nervous? Because I'm just, I'm not sure why he's going on this, I guess, tangent otherwise. A-list celebrities, nervous. Uh, that's one thing. Okay, so everyone gets nervous as one thing in common. Okay, I don't know if that's successful people or just human nature, maybe. The second thing is, and I, I learned this from an interview with Kevin Turner that, that worked with uh, Sam Walton and Bill Gates and Ken Griffin. The super successful people are not content people. You, you guys call it happy, but 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 you're you're confusing it with contentment. They're happy. They're just not contented. They're they're divine. It's what Kevin calls di divine discontentment. Yeah, I think Ed Milet kind of talks about this too in a lot of his content of saying like that he's happy, but he always wants more success and he always wants to try harder. And I don't know. There's got to be something really exhausting about living that way. I'll be honest with you. I think it's important to want to get better, but I think this constant like hustle and struggle and not like sitting and just being in content in what you have. I don't know. It doesn't seem like a recipe for a satisfied life. And that gives me approval 
the, the, the positive part of that, it gives me permission to be a bit not satisfied. Right? There's some really weird cuts in this podcast. I'm sure they're using something like Descript, which is what I use to edit my videos. Um, but it feels like some of these have been really cleaved off. Um, in the previous first part, there's like whole subject changes that are just like in the middle of Grant Cardone when he's talking. And this feels like one too. Right, because my whole life, basically I had a psychologist or psychiatrist or some health and fitness magazine or mental health magazine telling me I had a problem because I'm never completely satisfied. And the truth is, I think that's God's way of getting you guys to keep pressing to your next level, your next potential. It's funny how he talks about levels. I mean, Scientology, we know, has levels, right? Levels of ascension. And I don't know what the highest level is, but yeah, like the idea is to like reach enlightenment through the levels. So it's interesting that he's kind of taken this practice and sort of put it not just in a spiritual sense, but like in a sort of life accomplishment sense. And, 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 you know, in my house now, do we not, we're not looking to be satisfied. We don't want to be satisfied. We're always reaching for our potential. My wife's always pushing me to do more, be more, impact more, help more people, create more wealth. I find this a little bit sad. I mean, I'm not saying that your spouse shouldn't like encourage you to be better, but if my partner was always like, pushing me and pushing me. I don't know. There's got to be a place where you can just relax and be completely yourself. And I don't know if Grant Cardone has that. For myself, for other people, like we, we have, we have permission now to be more. There's nothing wrong with me or you because I want more. I don't think there's anything wrong with you. I'm just saying that it seems like a frustrating way to live, I guess, to me. I don't know, to not just ever be able to like relax a little bit, to like take the foot off the gas, so to speak, like a little bit. We all need to coast sometimes. Well, then yeah, why that should I, be, a, that yeah, should why be everybody. I, yeah, why would I be happy with what I'm doing if I know I can do more? Yeah, yeah, a thousand percent. Thousand percent, okay. I, I love that. I, I, that's such a fantastic breakdown. I think it's I, I, I think it's important to know, you know, even, you know, captains of industry. And I interview, you know, the same people you interview. And it, it, it is incredible how nervous they get. And, you know, for anybody listening, you know, you the more you do it, you still get butterflies, but they just fly in formation after a while, right? So that's it. You just got to learn to like break through it. But uh, fantastic breakdown, uh, Grant. Really appreciate that. Now, I do want to ask you about Cardone Capital because- I do want to ask about Cardone Capital because it's in a talking point in my podcast and probably why you agreed to come on it was that I would be able to talk on your platform about my thing that I want to sell. This is fascinating to me. Uh, what the little you know, it was on their end. You're doing with that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, like a real estate syndication, uh, if, yeah. if I'm correct, right? Where you pool money from retail investors to buy you yeah. know, multifamily properties. That's what you're doing, right? Uh, what's interesting about Cardone Capital, for those that don't know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, is you're bringing the product to a retail investor, which otherwise the Goldmans, the Black Rocks, uh, people that you know, can't invest in these, in these products, and you're bringing it to a retail investor, which I find fascinating. So how big is that? that opportunity for Cardone Capital and for the retail investor. If we think about financial planners, whether they work in like a bank or for a mortgage company or, you know, some kind of financial institution or whether they're self-employed, either way, I think they have to go through some kind of accreditation process. And part of that accreditation process maybe involves passing a test. It also involves continuing education. But besides those sort of credentials that you need to maintain, there's also what's called a fiduciary responsibility that they have for you as their client. And if you're just giving Grant Cardone money, I'm wondering, like, has he had to jump through any hurdles to be able to financially responsibly manage your money? And does he have these same sort of ethics that he's operating under? Could you just decide one day, hey, I'm going to start a million dollar real estate investment fund and you can just collect money from people until you get to a million dollars and then buy a property? Like, can you just do that? I don't know. It seems like this would be a highly regulated thing. And I don't know if Grant Cardone is the kind of person that um, can work through a lot of red tape, let's just say. So, you know, there's a number of things that we're doing that has never been done and very different than what... Uh, Wall Street particularly has done. Okay. So 
I thought this would be more about marketing. It's turning more into business, which is fine because obviously Grant Cardone agreed to go on this podcast because he was going to get a platform. Right? So what I want to do to make this more of a marketing exercise instead of us just listening to Grant Cardone try to sell us something, let's see what sales tactics he uses to talk about Cardone Capital and see if we can't point them out as they're happening. Now I'm going to go back to your comment about Elon, okay? I wrote a book called If You're Not First, You're Last. And it basically... If you're not first, you're last. When I was in fifth grade, I had a no fear t-shirt. If you, 90s kids, if you know, you know. And my no fear t-shirt said, second place is first loser. I know. I didn't know I was a douchebag in fifth grade. Okay, guys. But this has this, this title has the, this, if you're not first, you're last has the same energy as that t-shirt. It was a book about, I was trying to figure out, I write my books for me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out. Oh, that's good. I think people should write books from their perspective for them, not trying to sort of preach to other people. I think when people do that in books, it definitely comes through as pretty condescending. So good for you, Grant, for writing for yourself. Throw out something. I have a problem, okay? Like no one knew me uh, 10 years ago. I wrote a book called, I, I, the book The book was like, what would I have to do to get known to be first of mine in a bunch of different industries? Because I had a problem. I was only known. He wrote his first book in 2008. This interview happened in 2023. That's more than 10 years ago. I Sometimes when Grant talks about his timeline, I feel like it's not quite right. Known in one industry and the industry got hammered in 2008. My income got hammered. I didn't have customers. They got cut in half. My prices went down. My family was at risk. It, like, it just got terrible in 2008 for me. It did for a lot of people. It was a big recession. That was when the housing crisis happened and everything. Yeah, a lot of people were in bad shape at that time. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, not enough people know me. Okay. I was, I was dependent upon one industry. Now, now we're in 50 industries to, uh, 10 years later. I wish you'd give an example of this was the one industry I'm in. And then here's three very different industries that we're in now and why it's a diversified way to look at things. I wish you'd give a concrete example. So I wrote in this book, look, you, you make a list of what your competitor won't do and do it. This is why Elon bought Twitter, by the way. I Elon bought Twitter because he was forced to. This rewriting of the narrative is so interesting for me. Also, I don't, I do not know what Grant Cardone wants with Elon Musk. I believe, I, I don't know this to be true 100%, but I believe he bought Twitter because he can do with it what Washington Post, CNN, CNBC, and Fox News will not do. I think it's really interesting that he thinks only news outlets would buy Twitter. There's plenty of other potential buyers to Twitter that I think are better candidates than like news agencies. I mean, they have their distribution channels and running a tech company is a lot different than running a media company. I mean, some media companies are tech companies, but I don't know. Which is share the truth. And there's a whole big giant ass audience out there that's like, I will pay for the truth. I but it's not like Elon is fact checking any of these things. So how do we know it's the truth? I'd rather pay for the truth than get than get lies uh, for free. And I think he's doing what, you know, what is it called? Mass media or um, the mass media, whatever they call them, right? Mainstream uh, media. <laughs> mainstream mainstream yeah. media. Yeah, what mainstream yeah. media won't do. So Grant, I have a question for you. What is the mainstream media not doing that you think that Twitter is doing specifically? besides the truth. Because the only thing I see Twitter doing that's different than mainstream media is letting people buy blue check marks and not shutting down hate speech. That's the only things I see that are happening differently on Twitter than they would be, say, in the New York Times, where they have people who are fact-checking and who are regulating the comments below articles and, and things like that. Um... That, that, that's kind of what I'm doing in some of these spaces that I'm in, right? I'm making a list of what will my competition not do to the card on capital. So the way he's telling the story is I'm doing what people won't do. So he's kind of positioning himself as a bit of a hero, a bit of a, I'm seeing what people want and I'm giving to them. So I am every man. I am a hero. I am doing what these other companies won't do. So I basically looked at who would I want to become in the future. Okay. He keeps like alluding to things and not explaining. So, okay, Grant, like, what are these companies not doing and who do you want to become in the future? Why don't you, like answer those questions as you're going along? Cause 
otherwise this feels really vague. Well, when we start building real estate out, I'm not, I don't want to become my uncle that, that had 80 apartments. I want to become Blackstone, a Harbor group that's got 100,000 units. Starwood's got 140,000 units. These are So his uncle only had 80 apartments and he wants hundreds of thousands of apartments. Is it just the scale that he's after or is it that he's hands off? I bet his uncle with 80 apartments was always going and like fixing stuff for tenants or helping navigate disputes and things like that. I'm guessing that he wants scale like that so that he could be paying people to deal with the smaller stuff. I'm guessing that's the only thing I could think of. These companies are worth, you know, Blackstone's got, Blackstone added 30,000 units last year. God, I know these big corporations owning most housing in America is just so discouraging, isn't it? Uh, 10,000 are in Florida. Okay. So what, what will they not do? First of all, Blackstone only takes money from institutions, hedge funds, uh, and, you know, big, big, big uh, Hartford um, $58 billion pension funds, mm -hmm. helpers, teachers credit union. They, they don't talk to Annie, my, oh. my, 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 you know, uh, personal executive. Okay. So they will only make these kind of real estate investments if they have large amounts of capital from institutions or corporations. Okay. It's a, that's a non-accredited investor. They, they don't care about her. They care about big, big money, sovereign funds. So what won't they do? Number two, they don't have long-term 10-year cycles. They have short three-year cycles, three and five-year funds. They tell you that's for you. It's not for you. It's for them so they can get their exit fee. Okay. Okay. So we didn't build a three or five-year fund. They don't pay people every month. They pay people every quarter. We pay people every month. So I think most dividends pay quarterly. So that's not an unusual thing in investing to get paid every three months instead of every month. I don't know. This feels like when MLM people say, in my company, you get paid every week. I feel like if you gave me this fake scenario where you said, Nicole, I'll give you $100 every week for a month. Or if you said, if you wait till the end of the month, I'll give you $800. I'm going to wait till the end of the month. And I understand that pretty much everybody who isn't living paycheck to paycheck and, you know, would theoretically really need the hundred dollars every week. I feel like everyone else is fine getting paid a little bit later if they get more money. So I don't know. I feel like this whole, we pay more frequently is going after a certain demographic that needs to see the money sooner rather than later, in which case, how does this guy feel good about taking their money for an investment that has risk? They can't afford that risk. So what we did was we went to the retail investor. We use social media. They don't use it at all. So financial institutions had to be careful about using social media because they're under a lot of regulations. It sounds like Grant's investment company does not have the same responsibilities as a bank, a mortgage company, a financial planner. I've done social media work for those people and they literally have pages of rules to follow when it comes to making posts on social media. Sometimes you have to, depending on the organization, you have to submit them for approval weeks or like a month ahead of time. So it sounds like he doesn't have the same rules and regulations as a normal financial institution. And that makes me a little bit nervous. I'll be honest with you. Okay. I don't know anything about it. Like I said, I've done marketing work for these people and I have my own investments and sort of interest in finance, but, but this sounds risky to me. We use, we, we don't ever go to rich companies or super wealthy people. We give accredited and non-accredited $25,000 investor, a $5,000 investor, or a $25 million investor, exactly the same re returns invested in the same deal. We pay every single month. We have a 10-year cycle. We don't do redemptions, okay? Blackstone offers redemptions. You know, you guys know why they offer redemptions? Because the, where they get their money from, like MetLife, requires there to be a provision from turn like we're in right now. They'll make a phone call, Hartford or New York Life, hey, man, we need $2 billion. Or the Florida State Pension Fund, we need our $2 billion back and Blackstone will send them the money back and you guys are left holding the bags. You don't have direct investments in Blackstone. What you have is basically some. I'm trying to look up what redemptions are because I, I really don't know about this. 
Let's learn about redemptions together. In finance, redemption refers to the repayment of any fixed income security at or before the asset's maturity date. Bonds are the most common type of fixed income security, but others include CDs, treasury notes, or preferred shares. Mutual fund investors can request redemptions for all or part of their shares from their fund manager. Redemptions may trigger capital gains or losses for the investor. So I can pull my money out early, but obviously I'm not going to make as much as if it, you know, made more value over the full course of time it would take it in and I would pay losses on it of some sort, but I would be able to get my money. So saying he doesn't offer redemptions is interesting because that means that people can't pull their money out of this. And I'm curious how he's going to frame this as a good thing. Piece of paper sitting in a mutual fund or an IRA with Vanguard, and you don't even know they're invested in Blackstone. Mm -hmm. We also pass on all the benefits. You can choose what, what mutual fund to put your money into. And if you don't want to invest in Blackstone, pick a mutual fund that doesn't invest in Blackstone. You can also buy individual stocks to mix in with your mutual funds too. You don't have to invest in companies that you don't want to. That I, as an owner, would get in those assets and Blackstone does not give that to you. But it's not just Blackstone. It's Blackstone, Starwood. It's the whole list of guys that run real estate in America. And my goal is to, to literally become those guys, but do it by crowdfunding with regular people like you guys. I want to get rich by using small amounts of money from a lot of people like you guys. Yeah, it's 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 so interesting. And, you know, every time we come back to this guy, he literally says like, oh, um, you know, that's cool or that's interesting. When we had you on the show last, I think your portfolio was close to two billion. Now it's at four. So you've grown and scaled really fast. Like, yeah, it, well, we were, we were probably closer to five billion before this contraction. We've already rebooked our our assets, mm -hmm. pulled them down a billion dollars. But again, like I'm not selling anything, okay? People are giving you money though. So what are they buying? This month, every month this year, since February, we paid $4 million to our investors. This month, while other firms are having trouble, we're paying $6 million out to our investors. $6 million spread out across how many people? So 100% of the money, 100% of the money goes into the to the real estate, 100%. There's no broker fees, no management fees, nothing comes out before the investment goes in. There's no middleman. We we don't pay a bank any money. Like you literally invest. Where is your money being kept if it's not being kept in a bank? Directly with me into the real estate is black backed by real estate. The money stays in that one real estate deal until at which time we go to sell that asset. Yeah. Ooh, this sounds weird to me. Listen, I'm not saying the current system is it, but I'm saying handing Grant Cardone money with absolutely no way to get it back and this vague promise of payments every month without knowing what kind of return I can expect. It's like when Eric Worre in The Rise of the Entrepreneur, his documentary about MLMs he did when he was like, you know, there is all the, you know, there's, you know, 200 million MLM distributors in the United States and they, they create an ex excess of like $2 billion. I don't know. He used these numbers, but he separated them without actually dividing them into each other. And when we did the math, we realized that the average network marketer with his numbers made like a little bit over a thousand dollars total. So I feel like he's saying they're going to pay out $6 million this month. How many people are invested? If he's taking $5,000 from this person and, you know, $20,000 from that person, it takes a while to get to six, six billion, how, five billion, how many, how much did he say it was worth total? And then he's paying dividends. So he's paying, you know, $6 million this month in dividends. Last month it was 4 million. But the thing with dividends is that they can vary and it you're paid off of the profits. So if there's no profits, you don't really get paid anything. So it's not like you're getting a guaranteed check for the same amount every month or every three months or whatever. You're getting a portion of the profits. Yeah, it's a fascinating model. Um, I do want to ask. Fascinating. It's fascinating that people would just give you money for you to buy real estate without using a bank and you have absolutely no fiduciary responsibility. Your money is not, the money is not insured by the FDIC. Like 
so fascinating that this is actually working. We have to ask you, like, well, <laughs> again, we'll wrap it up soon, but uh, we have to ask you about, you, you know, your strategy when looking at potential deals. Like, what's the criteria uh, when you look at putting a deal together? Because I think this is really important to ask you about if we have you on. Also, if he's doing like hundreds of trans- real estate transactions a month, there's no way that he's handling them all himself. So how is he like, how is he finding people to find these deals, vet them, and then do them, right? If he's working that quickly. Yeah, so so uh, number one is location. Mm-hmm. We, we never compromise location for price. So good location is Florida. Uh, everybody knows the term location, location, location. Most people don't really know what that means. Location for me means I have job migration into my location. Two, I don't have a government making it impossible for me to collect my rents. So that, that counts that knocks off about 25 states right there that we like New York state, which it has very good tenant laws. We will not invest in. We don't go into states that have good tenant laws. We want to make sure we have the law on our side. Uh, including great real estate states, by the way, uh, with barriers to entry. Three, it has to cash flow from day one. We don't build assets that are empty. We only, ex- like I closed on a deal, I want cash flow next month. Hmm. Uh, four, we want to buy under replacement costs or under the, the the cost of the last person that bought it. Uh, basically, that's code for I want to steal something. And number five, there's got to be upside in that property. Oh, there's a cut there. So that that's a short list yeah. of things. Uh, but I've been doing this 35 years in real estate. The first been in, he's been in business for 35 years. Now he's been in real estate for 35 years. I don't know. I think he's been in real estate for less time. Then he's had a business. 30 years was very quiet. The last five years, I got noisy about it. First 30 years, I was figuring out what I was doing. And now I've never, ever lost a deal in a real estate. I've been Really? Not even one time? Been through 2008, 2000. I've been through bus collapses. I'm going to go through this cycle. These cycles, what we're going through right now are the best opportunities to add real estate. And this may be the last opportunity you guys get to actually own real property in All right. So, okay. I'm the hero. Let's go through his little tactics here. So there's all these big, you know, real estate investors. I'm just the little guy. I'm working with people like my personal assistant who can invest like $5,000 into this. I'm paying them dividends every month, not quarterly, like all these investment assholes I'm paying monthly. And I am picking properties based on this super high criteria So I'm being very selective. So I know what I'm doing. In America, that creates wealth long-term. And this might might be the last opportunity for you to buy into this. So he's creating scarcity. So that's the tactics I see him using here. Fascinating. Very interesting. I hope. Fascinating and interesting. I love these podcast people. They're not like challenging their guests. And I don't mean challenging, like being combative. I mean, like having a discussion asking intelligent questions back, really diving in. This is definitely like sort of a PR thing for Grant Cardone because they're just softballing him these really easy questions. Why not ask him some questions back about some of the stuff he said? Like, what do you mean by this? Or, you know, what are some of the kinds of people that you've been able to work with and, and allow to invest in real estate that maybe you wouldn't have been able to otherwise? But This podcast is a PR fluff piece for Grant Cardone because we're asking him softball questions. He's pretty prepared um, and we're just complimenting him after he answers everyone. Hope everybody was taking notes and Grant, you know, uh, just taking notes on what? It's going into 2023. Like I should try to get thousands of dollars from people who don't have a lot of money so that I can try to compete with these big real estate investors I don't know if that's something we're all striving for. I'll be honest. I just want to ask about, you know, words of motivation, goal setting. Uh, For some, you know, their goals this year might be different uh, or look different than they did in years past. A lot of uncertainty going into the new year. So so, going into the new year. Okay. This must've been in December. It said five months ago. So um, I guess technically I'm recording this the last day of June. So I guess five months ago. Okay. So end of the year. Okay. So maybe this is like 
late December, early January. Like, what do you do to strategize and goal set for the new year? Or is it just part of a five, 10 year world domination plan that you have? Or what, like, what do you specifically do to, you know, um, a goal set for the new year? And what, what should people be thinking about? Or what's the most important thing for entrepreneurs, sales professionals yeah, so, think about? So, so what I'm looking to do all the time is, is we, we did about $150 million in revenue this year. In 2022, my goal is to take that to $1.5 billion in 10x revenue, income. So gross top line income. Now, can you imagine working for him? You're like, hey, boss, we made you $153 million this year. And he looks at you and says, I want it 10x. I want $1.53 billion. Now, how do I do that? <laughs> now, what I have to do is I got to start working on how do you do that? You cannot grow a business 10 times. I cannot grow that much revenue with the audience that I have. I guess you've gotten the revenue from the audience that you currently have perhaps. And I can't spend enough money in advertising to do that. So what do I have to do? How do I do it? Goes back to the question earlier. Everybody's going to tell me I can't do it, but how could we do it? If we could do it, how could we do it? My God, I cannot imagine working for this person. Well, I know that there's that much money on planet earth. The leader, the visionary has to be like convinced completely this is possible. I believe he's completely convinced this is possible. I do believe that. You guys have to be convinced because if you have two people working for you, 20 people working for you or 200, it will not be possible to them. They're not you. You have to hold the vision. Yeah, I agree with that. So the first thing you got to do is get sold on the concept. So what I just go through this little drill, okay? So his only goal setting for the year is look at what you did last year and try to 10X it so that you feel constantly dissatisfied because you'll be, you won't be able to do that every year or... It's just not uh, $1.5 billion in a year. Does anybody else make that kind of money? Yes. Is that money available on planet Earth? Yes. If I took that much, mon much money off of planet Earth, um, would I be doing good or bad? Oh, man, I it depends what you're doing with the money. If, if you're hoarding it, you're not really doing much good. Help more people, period. So I'm like, But how are you helping people with the money? Like, okay. He just said he wanted to be like the biggest real estate investors. Like he wanted to be Blackstone or whatever. I don't know. I don't know that those companies do a lot of good. I'm just saying. The money's there. Other people are doing it. I can do it too. How can I do it? And now I got to figure out, okay, can I do it in 12 months? Probably not. Is it a worthwhile goal to work toward? Seems like it to me. Seems like it'd be a lot of damn fun. The one thing I know for sure I need is people. I need more people to know me, more people to work with me, more partners, more investors, more connections. I need more people. I need more haters. I, I need more money from small people, small, I need more money from regular people. I need more people t talking about why I'm a piece of garbage and I'm just a con man and a scammer and a jack and, you know, a spammer and a scammer and whatever else they call me, right? So I want to say something explicitly if you've never heard me say it before. I want to say it now. Or maybe this is your first video and you would have never heard me say it anyway, but You'll notice if you watch these reaction videos, I'm very careful about what I say about these people. And that's on purpose. There are sort of two groups of things that I don't talk about. Number one, I don't talk about people's appearance in a general way. Now, the only thing I said about his appearance was in the first video, he seemed angry, but his face wasn't expressing it. And I said that he maybe it's Botox because this area of his face doesn't seem to be moving too much. I didn't say it in a judgmental way, like, oh, he got Botox. That's so stupid. Or, or, oh, he got Botox. That's great. Like, I'm completely neutral about whether he uses Botox or not. I was just hypothesizing. That's why his facial expressions didn't seem to match what he was saying. But I don't comment on people's appearance positively or negatively, really. If someone's well put together, I'll say, wow, they're well put together. And in this case, Grant's really well lit. He, it's professionally done. And it's a lot better than a lot of video content I've seen. So you'll see that, like, I'll also not only say bad things about them. I'll say when they're right about something. And I don't mind doing that. I think it's more powerful if I do that. Because it's hard to pretend that someone's a total liar when you know some of what they're saying is true. So hearing me say, hey, this person is saying these things that aren't true, but they're also saying this, which is true, I think makes it more realistic. Because, yeah. Yeah. These gurus, if they wouldn't have gotten as far as they have if they didn't have a little nugget of truth in some of the stuff they were saying. Another thing I'll never mention is things in their personal life unless they make it a part of their marketing. So for example, in this video, Grant Cardone talks about his wife and she's on the website that he referenced right on the homepage. So I feel like when he talks about her, I can respond to the way he talks about her. 
But other than that, I am not really going and digging around. I do think Scientology informs some of his worldviews and has given him access to interview some of the celebrities he's interviewed, which is why I brought that up. Again, unless it's part of the marketing we're talking about, I'm not bringing it up. And I think it's important. I'm not a journalist or anything, but I think it's important for me to present things as truthfully as I can, because I think that makes me more creditable. I'm sure that I probably would have a lot more subscribers if I made fun of these people more or whatever, but I just can't bring myself to do it. It feels mean and it's not the way I want to communicate about their marketing messages. If you are thinking about Grant Cardone and you've happened upon this video, I think you would feel comfortable watching it up until this point because I haven't been mean, because we've just been reacting to words he's saying, not words that I'm putting in his mouth. So in case you're wondering, that's intentional. I get that it makes these videos maybe a little bit more boring, but like, I don't know. I think it's just the right way to approach it. All right, let's get back to it. Now, I, I need a bunch more people waiting for me to go busted and bankrupt. I need my family to be annoyed because I'm not available. Okay. He wants to be unavailable to his family. That seems weird. You have a ton of money. Like, why not? Why not watch your kids grow up? Why not spend time with your wife? Like, why have you worked so hard to get to this point if you don't want to do that stuff? Because where, where I'm going to go, I'm going to leave some of my family members behind. Mm -hmm. They're not. Whoa. Like, what is, which ones? Also, this guy has the zoom filter, like, turned way all up. On, they're not going to all take this ride. The ride you guys are on. If you're going to go on a big ride, you're leaving some people behind. Yeah. Yikes. It makes me, like, if I was his family member watching this, I'd be like, is he going to leave me behind? The yeah. people that love you, David, the people that love and support you guys, they say they love and support you. But you got to understand what they're saying to you is, I love and support you the way you are. And they, yeah. those people unconsciously do not want you to change. They are threatened by your change. So just you be know, aware of that going into 2023. If you're worried someone is, why not have the conversation with them? I mean, I'd like to think that most people understand that as a human being, you're going to change over time. And as long as sort of your your morals and ethics or fundamental things about you don't change, that they can be on board. Like, I'm sure if I decided to start dressing more like bohemian, I'm sure that my boyfriend would be like, oh, you don't normally dress like that, but okay. You know what I mean? Like people are going to change and it's, it's okay. Like who doesn't change over time? This is, this is odd. It also sounds like you're hard on yourself, Grant. Um, is this guy going to try to like give Grant Cardone sort of a, a hug over the microphone? Sounds like you're hard on yourself, yeah. but yeah. yeah. Oh, he's hard on, yeah. That's the thing with Grant Cardone is like, I just see the pain in his eyes sometimes and I just want to give him a hug. And I think I said that about the first video I reacted to, like, I don't know, a year and a half ago almost when he was talking about how someone called him Uncle G and he always told his mom that he wanted to be a great uncle kind of figure to someone someday because he didn't have one. I just, I see this, this person who's, you know, really hard on himself and, and unsatisfied with, with where he is. And part of me can be annoyed by some of his hot takes, but part of me also sees like, you know, you don't want other humans to, he is hard on himself. It's in these moments, I see these little glimmers in Grant Cardone of like sadness and it's, I don't want to give him a hug a little bit. Um, and that gives me permission to be hard on other people. Yeah. Okay. Well, no. Yeah. No, it doesn't. You being hard on yourself does not give you permission to be hard on other people. That's not how that works. No, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation. I think It's an interesting conversation. I don't agree with this, but I have to be polite because you're paying to be on this podcast potentially or paying for an ad spot. So I can't really say anything that challenges you too much. I think, I think it's important to take stock of where you are and where you're going. I always say work backwards from where you want to be. Yep. Um, 2023 is going to be interesting um, uh, for a lot of people. So just, I hope everybody's been paying attention to what Grant says there. Uh, Podcast host, can you summarize the points that Grant Cardone has made? I would love to watch him try to summarize what Grant Cardone has said here. To wrap things up, I know there's a couple of questions in the chat. I don't think we have oh. time to get to them. Uh, Grant's time is, is, is valuable, but... Um, 
coming up, you've got the growth con coming up in February, I believe. We don't have time to answer questions in chat, but we do have time to promote this event. It looks like there's another approximately five minutes. Of this. Uh, and, and the projects you talked about, what do we have to look forward to with your uh, future projects, especially growth con? What can we expect there? Did you announce speakers, et cetera? Did you do that? No, we, we never. It was another cut there. Never announced speakers before our event. Ever we never announced speakers before our event. So people are just supposed to sign up for the event and hope the speakers are good. I don't know. Part of what I decide to go into a conference is like what the programming is like. Am I going to learn something new at this conference? Is it more geared toward marketing people or is it more geared toward web developers? Is there going to be mostly sessions for people in certain industries or is it going to be more general? Like these are the kinds of questions that can be answered by looking at what the different topics are for you know the speakers and the panelists and all that everybody's uh, surprised but i can tell you who we have offers for i got offers out for jay-z dave Chappelle. one name i can't mention but we talked about earlier the uh okay uh, barry sternlick at starwood all the people that i want to meet with and talk to i'm sending invites to do you think jay-z is going to show up so we we sent a big i don't think jay-z is going to show up checks and say, hey, man, Jay, I'd like to have you at my conference. When you're ready to cash this check, just accept it. Let's go. Is uh, is is App still on? Maybe he can do the uh, Jay-Z intro. I don't know. He's a new album drop. No, Jay-Z's Jay -Z one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. I met him on multiple occasions. He's a fantastic human. I would love to meet him, man. I, I, I'd like to do uh, 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 the, the Beckham and his wife, me and my wife and his wife. and, and Victoria? and victoria do, do an interview with those guys about couples um, he wants to be with david and victoria beckham as like couple friends that would be interesting but um, I think it's gonna kanye happen. i was gonna have kanye man but he just kind of slipped overboard on me I'm, that's one way to put it <laughs> i love kanye west i love his music uh when he was ragging on balenciaga i'm like yeah that's cool let's rag on balenciaga i don't like those people anyway he never liked their clothes and, and then he went a little bit too far so everybody okay he went a little bit too far i'm glad grant cardone can see that nazi sympathizing is like a bridge too He's far me i can't have him andrew tate if i had andrew tate my kids would not come to the event they're like i hate that guy good yeah i think he's got a couple of daughters so some of this I, is my wife and kids keep me from having some of these more controversial people. I, I, the fact that you need external people to keep you from making those kind of decisions. Uh, do you want to give this guy a billion dollars? Like, do you think like you should take between five and $25,000 that it's taken you like years to save up? And do you feel like handing it to this guy and letting him judge where to put it? I don't know. I, I just see lapses in these personal judgment things from him and I'm just like mm, I don't know I got to tell you, you know, like I interview all the time too, just like you. And yeah. it's funny what gets us going, you know, like people we want to interview. I've interviewed people. My daughters have not been happy. I, I can tell you that as well. It's the same thing. Who? But it's, you know, it's what intrigues us. You're being paid to do the interviews, I'm guessing. So hopefully you can say things like, hey, daughter, like, sorry, my stupid job is making me do this stupid interview and I have to like be a dude, bro. I'm so sorry. Let me, you know take you out to a nice dinner uh, to make up for it, I guess. Grant, uh, final question. What's your definition of success? I want to know what the Grant Cardone definition of success is, because a lot of people on here, they want to have a successful year coming up. A lot of people on the call today are very successful. So what's your definition of success? Well, Never being satisfied. You guys look like a bunch of successful people. So one thing I would, I would define success as is all of us having a party together and getting to know each other better. You know, maybe we're on a yacht in the south of France or the Mediterranean or something, hanging out for a week or two. Um, yeah, I'm sure these people have like two weeks to just hang out and not work. Um, I'll buy as long as you guys are fun. So that would be <laughs> successful, right? Because those are memories and experiences, right? Right. Life is like... Hey, Grant Cardone, if you want to hire me to go on a yacht, I'm super fun. And I've been told I'm really funny. So I... And I can also make a pretty mean gin and tonic. <laughs> You know, you can have all the money in the world. If you don't have some positive experiences to go with it, that doesn't seem like success. But also, it would also be reaching for my potential. Reaching for my potential, a.k.a. never being satisfied. You know, like, once the trip's over, what else am I doing? Mm -hmm. You know, and, yeah. and what, what am I doing to find the next level of grant, to find out what else can I do?
whether it's charitable or financial or physical, maybe it's my physical help or health, or maybe it's my wife and I trying to figure out how to improve our relationship. You know, as we, as we, we've been married almost 20 years now, how do we make that better as it changes? Cause it's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, how do I, how do I improve the relationship with my children as they go through, you know, teenage years? So um, by the way, I was with Hormozy. Uh, I, I actually was in Cabo two days ago. Somebody talking about Alex Hormozy being here. And uh, my daughter and I went out into the ocean on a, on those little sea bobs. And we would go from boat to boat, just saying hi to people. We didn't know anybody. And the third boat that we went up to was Alex was on. So he's like, Greg Cardone, what are you doing in the ocean? That would be weird. You know, you pull up to Greg Cardone in the middle of the ocean. That would be a strange right? one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Grant, okay. Th you know, I can't thank you enough. David, are you Canadian? You have like a Canadian air about you. I don't know if it's your politeness or like the cadence of your voice, but I'm getting a Canadian vibe from you. Uh, for uh, joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, you know, really appreciate you uh, jumping on. Drop some gems and some knowledge as it relates to branding, marketing, and of course, real estate, the economy, some other things. Can't wait to see you and what you have in store for the new year. Cardone Capital as well, 2023 and beyond. Uh, really fantastic. Where do you want the people to go you, and f Look, obviously follow you on social? Uh, where else do you want everybody to go yeah, and, so, and click yeah. through? You know, like, you know, if you Google me one time, I'll follow you around the internet forever. So, um, you know, the thing that I'd most like the audience to do is, you know, you guys check into Cardone Capital, what I'm doing there. I am literally going to change finance. No one has ever done this before, allowing everyday people to invest in institutional quality assets. I am going to buy the best real estate I've ever bought in my life, and I'm going to share it with people just like me. And I'm not going to use the banks or institutions or hedge funds to do it. This has never been done before at the level I'm doing it at. Sounds dangerous. And I'm literally going to build a $40 billion or $50 billion treasure chest of institutional quality assets that your family and my family keep for long periods of time, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. It'll, it'll build massive generational wealth. And the exit will be first, your cash flow you get every month. Second, appreciation over long periods of time. Three, we either become a, a, a Blackstone, which would be a major score, that you would become a, an investor in a future bank. This has been done many, many times, by the way. J.P. Morgan was a person, okay? Uh, they're, they're, you know, like the, these institutions, the, these, the Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, this guy was a damn, like, grinder, okay, that became a major institution, so that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build here, okay? So the exit are we either exit and sell to one of these groups or we become a REIT and we all become owners in a piece of paper on the stock exchange uh, or we become some of these names that I'm talking about right now. But it's going to be a big win for everybody with me. So if you guys like real estate, you like real estate investing, you like it as a safe place, check out Cardone Capital and invest in my next deal uh, alongside me. Fantastic. Uh, as we always say, everyone, success leaves clues. The one and only Grant Cardone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh my God. They interviewed millionaire mentor, Jason Stone. They, he was one of the second or third people. Oh my God. They're interviewing millionaire mentor, Jason Stone. He was the fourth person I've ever reacted to in this series. Everything always comes full circle here. All these gurus know each other, guys. They write nice things in each other's book jackets they give testimonials on each other's stages and websites. Basically, they're in this little club that you and I will never be able to get into. And they attribute their success not to the fact that they're able to build their audience off of all of these other gurus' audiences, but that they're a really good business person and that they're really good at marketing. So do I think Greg Cardone knows what he's talking about? It sounds like he's one of those people that's like all publicity is good publicity in which case, I think he's really good at having these hot takes and doing these interviews and getting clips of him shared around the internet. But I'm not sure if he would be able to say, look at your company, even if it was something in his wheelhouse, like a real estate company. I'm not sure if he'd be able to take a look at it and give you concrete advice for how to change your marketing or branding to have better outcomes for your business. I don't think he'd be able to do that, but I definitely think he'd charge you a lot of money to try. And that's just my take on it. So thanks so much for watching. If you have a guru you want me to react to or even a specific video, you can leave it as a comment on this or any of my other videos. Or if you're more private, you can use the contact form of the website to reach me and I will get it there. If you want to lightly keep in touch, 
A good way to do that is to join our email newsletter. If you go to breakingeveninc.com slash newsletter, you'll see samples of past issues before you sign up. It's a monthly newsletter. We're not going to bug the crap out of you, but sometimes people like to hear from us other ways besides YouTube. So that's a way. And thank you so much for watching and consider subscribing every Friday. One of these videos goes live where I talk about a marketing guru. And uh, sometimes I revisit some of our favorites. Sometimes I find new ones, but the thing is these marketing gurus are just going to keep coming. But the good news is you have a friend and that's me in the marketing business. Take care.